Hi, my name's Aaron Shapovalov. I'm with Mormonism Research Ministry, and I'm here with Luke Wayne of Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, otherwise known as CARM and MRM. Yesterday, Luke, a brother, and I, we, we had a conversation with some polygamous acquaintances, at least uh, young men from a polygamist group, and we talked quite a bit about the pre-existence, and we think it would be good for us to go through some of the same passages that were brought up um, so that we can encourage you Christians to uh, step through this issue of pre-existence. So let's jump right in. They brought up the story of the man who was born blind in John chapter 9. And the disciples ask, uh, was this man born blind because of uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 2 of chapter 9. Jesus answered, it was not th that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So as I understand it, the, the argument given is that there was a kind of background uh, worldview among the Jews that even was an occasion for asking this question and that background worldview according to our Mormon friends uh, is likely that of the pre-existence and so they see this as a proof text uh, pointing to the pre-existence. Luke, why is that a problem? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, the, I mean, first of all, it, the assumption that the disciples would only be asking this question if they believed in some sp spiritual pre-existence where we were in heaven as, you know, non, non-physical beings and then came down and got bodies is simply not true. In fact, we do have rabbinic sources that make reference to um, the idea of prenatal sin that uh, using, drawing from the text uh, primarily of Jacob and Esau, and the idea, and, but bringing forward the idea that someone might actually be guilty of something before they're born, not because they pre-existed in spiritual form, but because they were already fallen and capable of sending while in the mother's womb. So it sounds like you're saying that Jews had ideas about sinning possibly in the womb that had nothing to do with the pre-existence. That's, that's absolutely right, yes, yes. But the bigger deal here that's that's the, the the small thing is that there's no logical reason why their question has to assume that background but the bigger deal is that when we look at the eight preceding chapters leading up to John chapter 9 and everything that um, John has communicated to us about where we are from versus where Jesus is from and why that difference matters it uh, with that background in mind, when we get to John chapter 9, there's simply no room left for the Mormon pre-existence idea to fit in, even to the disciples' assumptions, Let's do which this. assumptions could be false. Let's just start with John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How is that relevant to the issue of pre-existence in Jesus Christ, Luke? Uh, so, we have here immediately, John opens his gospel with the idea that in the very beginning, there's God and His Word. And the Word is special because He is already in the beginning with God. Before anything else is created, He's there. And so the very first verse of John is already starting with the central premise that Jesus is unique, special, worthy of our attention and our worship because he was with God in the beginning and came from heaven. So this isn't even worth mentioning. If we were all with God in the beginning, to say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, uh, that would be insignificant if he's just among millions of others of us who were likewise that way. So the, Jesus is special in having been with the Father from the beginning. And similarly, if you move forward to verse 18 in chapter 1, it says that no man has seen God at any time, but the only unique God, which is in the, bo uh, in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. So there's a lot you could say from that verse, but relevant to our subject here, no one else but Jesus, the one who came from God, has ever seen has ever seen God, has ever seen the Father. Again, if the pre-existence was true, then we all would have... If we were all seen there seeing the Father, right. then it doesn't make sense to talk about Jesus as though he's special because he alone has seen the Father. To say no one has seen the Father doesn't make sense if we all came from the pre-existence having seen him. Absolutely, absolutely. And But you continue 
in uh, John chapter 3. Oh, the... don't skip my favorite, man. Oh. <laughs> John chapter 1 in the testimony of John the Baptist. Oh, uh, abso- oh uh, my uh, mistake. You're it's, absolutely it's right. It's all good. Uh, so <laughs> John the Baptist and Jesus have earthly birthdays that are relevant to the whole issue of preexistence because we know that John the Baptist was born before Jesus was. And so if there's any question of the primacy, though, of John over Jesus or Jesus over John, uh, when Jesus, uh, when, when, when uh, John the Baptist is introduced here in um, chapter 1, I'm looking for it real quick here, chapter 1, verse 30, John the Baptist says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me or above me, because he was before me. So even though John the Baptist has a birthday before Jesus, G, uh, John the Baptist says, hey, actually, Jesus is more important than me because he was before me. How is that relevant to this issue? Yeah. You think? Well, once again, you have the idea of Jesus' primacy, especially when you have this verse following on the two things that we just read in the same chapter, is emphasizing the unique heavenly eternal origin of Jesus versus the later created earthly origin of all of us. Yeah. Us. So Jesus is, the Word is with the Father, the Word becomes flesh, He alone has seen the Father, comes to make the Father known, and now John the Baptist is saying that Jesus is special because He, he, rank, he ranks above John the Baptist because He was before. So something special here about the unique pre-existence of Jesus. Now let's uh, head, head off to that other chapter. Okay, so in chapter 3, in the conversation with Nicodemus, the famous born-again passage, uh, Jesus, after explaining to Nicodemus that he must be born again, goes on to say um, that, beginning in verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know, we testify of the things we have seen, yet you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So he's setting himself up as the witness, the one who can reveal heavenly things and tell others about heavenly things. Well, he's why? uniquely suited to give this testimony. And he f- expressly says that in the very next verse, that no man has ascended up to heaven, so none of us have been able to go up and see heavenly things to be able to come back and testify about them. But he who came down from heaven, heaven, that is the Son of Man. So there's only one person who has actually seen heavenly things to be able to testify to them. And this one, he has, he's going to be ascending into heaven, but he alone has descended from heaven. This sounds kind of strange to say if we've all descended descended from from heaven. heaven. Yes. If we've all been with the Father, if we've all seen the Father, uh, if we've all descended from heaven, then why would we talk about Jesus as though he is uniquely special for having these attributes? If we'd all seen heavenly things before we came here, and we all descended from heaven, then we have all the same same qualities and the same right to speak to heavenly things that the Son of Man does, according Mm. to this passage. Mm. But there's only one who has those qualities. What other verses uh, have you seen in John that pertain to this topic? Later in the same chapter, we... uh, um, we come across a story where John the Baptist uh, says the, in verse 23, John was baptizing uh, in Aeneon near uh, Salim because there was much water there. And they, uh, people came and were baptized, uh, for John had not yet been cast into prison. And there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, He that was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, behold, the same is baptizing, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him, and that uh, the, the bride, sorry, he that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, and my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that comes from heaven is above all. 
So this seems interesting because there could be a legitimate question that this language that John uses of being of this world or of this earth perhaps pertains to just the spiritual condition of a person that they are perhaps uh, they're um, heavenly minded or of the heavenly kingdom. Um, I, right? I, are they are they heavenly versus worldly? Last uh, night, yeah. I, I think we put it this way. Um, so I asked our polygamous acquaintance uh, from the polygamous group. I, I said, "Are you saying that um, we've all descended from heaven, but only some act like it, or we've all seen the Father, but only some act like it, or we're all from above, but not everyone acts that way?" But here we have John the Baptist, who mm-hmm. is Jesus testifies elsewhere that this is the greatest prophet uh, among all who have been born of women and this is a man who's clearly filled with the spirit of God speaking the things of God what he's received from God and yet he says look I'm from the earth ultimately there's only so much I can testify of I can only speak of the things of the earth the one who Mm. is the one who is from heaven the one who came from heaven he can tell us about in fact the very next verse after he says those things, uh, so he that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, he testifies, and no man receives his testimony. So he comes from heaven, he's seen heaven, he's heard these things, and he testifies them to us. He's a unique witness because he's literally from heaven. Not just that he's heavenly in character, but the, he is from the heavenly places, and we are not. John the Baptist is making a singular reference with a singular yes, pronoun absolutely. to yes. Jesus. Yes. So Jesus is the one who comes from above, and he is above all. He, we, he is not of the earth. He didn't come from the earth. He came to the earth from above. Yes. And he, John the Baptist says, he who comes from heaven is above all. Again, he says that. Yes. So he's speaking of Jesus as uniquely having been from heaven. Yes, absolutely. In contradistinction to everyone else, us. Right, right. Next passage in your mind. So then we continue on to John chapter 6. My goodness, this is a theme, Luke. Yeah, it it does seem to be, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, And John chapter 6, beginning at verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, the crowds have come to him after he's multiplied the bread and loaves, and they've come just chasing another miracle for bread. And Jesus kind of calls them out on it. Mm. And then here, as they're, as they're coming to him, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moses ga- di- uh, did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the bread that gives us life, the miracle God has given, symbolized in Moses and the manna, the Mm -hmm. true bread from heaven that gives true life is the one who's come from heaven. And that's how Jesus speaks of himself as the one who, as he who He who came from heaven. Came down from heaven. And that's how we know he's the one who gives us life, is that he came from heaven. And no one else did. There isn't another from heaven person. This is part of what makes Jesus special. So if we flatten this out to say everyone comes down from heaven, then all these special statements about Jesus in the Gospel of John no, no longer seem to be uniquely significant. Absolutely of Jesus. right. Right. So uh, I imagine now to chapter eight. Chapter eight. Absolutely. Um, give me just a second there. Uh, and so you have. Uh, First in chapter 8, verse 23, I believe. Mm. Uh, So, again, Jesus confronting a crowd, and he says to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Mm. So, once again... He's continuing this idea. It's, it, at this point, it gets repetitious to say all the same things, but he, Jesus is sounding this drumbeat the whole time. You are from below, are from I am below, from above. I'm from above. That's you're a contrast. Wor- yes, you're from this world, I'm not. Uh, but, I am not of this world. And then he goes on to say, later in the chapter... Uh, now, just to stop you here, the, okay. there's this sort of question in the background of, is this just metaphoric language for sort of the moral status of a person or their membership in a particular kind of kingdom 
Um, it still kind of might be hanging over some people's heads where they're thinking, well, this is just language of uh, belonging to Christ or not belonging to Christ. Um, but it seems like we can't reduce Jesus' language to something that doesn't pertain to the literal fact of pre-existence here. So let, let's hear what, what you're looking at. Absolutely. Um, so give me just a second. I've lost my spot there. Uh, Mm. Before Abraham I was, I am yeah. starts in 48. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, it, he says it in verse 58. So I'll, I'll read the context. Uh, okay. Verse 56. Oh, I'll, I'll bounce back up to 55. But you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I, I would be a liar like you. And I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not every, even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus says, said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw him. Now, why would they pick up stones to throw at Jesus if he's making a statement that's just simply and sort of boringly true of all of humanity? If, we're all, if we all pre-existed Abraham's earthly birth, What's the big deal about Jesus saying, before Abraham was, I am? That's exactly right. And that he, when they, first of all, the Jews betray that they have no concept of a pre-existence because they say, you're not, uh, you're not 50 years old. Have you, could, could you possibly have seen Abraham? There's no idea in their mind of how he could have ever seen Abraham. Mm. Uh, so even in their, their objection, they show the argument that they that was wanted to make earlier from chapter 9 that there's this sort of background jewish assumption of a pre-existence is betrayed as untrue even mm. here where the jewish the jewish objection is there's no possible way you could have seen abraham before mm -hmm. but when jesus insists no before abraham was i am uh, i mean there's two layers to this first of all by claiming and the most relevant to our situation here by claiming the the origin from ancient times that before Abraham was ever created, Jesus already was. He's clearly claiming something supernatural of himself. He's placing himself above mankind. This means in, he has to have had descended. Yes. This makes him the one who descended. It makes, makes him a heavenly being, not a simple man or a This a is already pointing being. to yes. his deity. Um, but the second layer even it, gets yes, to his deity that when further. he said when he uh, he does not say, before Abraham was, I was, or before Abraham was, I came to be. He says, before Abraham was, ego I me, I am, which points back to the uh, God's own self-identification when Abraham said, what am I to call you? What am I to tell you the that your name is? Mm. And he says, I, I am that I am. So tell them my name is, I am. You mean God's uh, not the one who was externally identified by an infinite ancestry of gods that gave him his identity? Or? Uh, no, his, no, his very name is, okay, which God are you? I'm the God who actually is. I'm, I'm the God who exists. I'm the one who self-exists yeah, and I'm the one defines who, myself. Who, who actually am, <laughs> who actually is. So uh, in a sense, God actually names himself monotheism, which is uh, kind <laughs> of interesting. But, uh, but Jesus takes up that name and says, mm -hmm. before Abraham was, so you've, he's already said, I existed before Abraham. They challenged him on that. Mm. He doubles down, no, before Abraham was, I am. I've, I've, I've tried to explain this to uh, other people, others and say, look, you need to reread the Gospel of John. And when you come across a passage like this, be a little terrified of what you're dealing with here. <laughs> this isn't just a good moral teacher or just someone who, among billions of others, descended uh, you know, from a pre-existence. We're talking about God Almighty here. We're, we're talking about one who, you know, it, yeah, he stops the storm and the disciples say, who are we dealing with? Who, who is this? Uh, you should be shaking in your boots a little bit that you're Absolutely. not dealing with a mere pre-existent man who came. Right, right. And so, yeah, it, you can't get around this by saying, well, yes, Jesus was before Abraham simply because he's, he's they all pre-existed, but he's just a little bit older. Uh, that it, the whole point is that Jesus' heavenly origin makes him an entirely different class of being to which we have to regard completely differently than we would. He's not right. just one of us with a little more authority. 
Mm -hmm. It's we have to treat him as something utterly different than as just one another. Whereas Mormonism is saying we're all self-existent, we're all co-eternal with God, we all pre-existed Abraham's earthly conception. Right, right. So, yeah. Well, what's, uh, I think that concludes the walkthrough. Yep. So John. once you've gone through eight chapters of that, you get to chapter nine and it's pretty hard to read a pre-existence into what's being said. So this is why we would say that when you arrive at chapter nine and you see something that you think maybe might sort of kind of imply the pre-existence, that's pretty irresponsible to latch onto when you've already been able to spend eight chapters noticing that John himself has not incidentally, but on purpose made an incredibly big deal about the fact that Jesus uniquely pre-existed and we didn't. Yeah. Uh, he was from before, so let's just, let's just a review here. Uh, Jesus uniquely was with God in the beginning yes. as the Word. Uh, he is the one who saw the Father unlike any other right. and is the one making him known. He is the one that John the Baptist says comes before him. Even though he was physically born afterwards, yes. Uh, even though the, <laughs> even the birth, even the birthdays. Yeah. And in John chapter three, uh, it said that Jesus was from above. He's the one who is from above, and no one well, no one has ascended except he who has descended. So Jesus is the one who has descended. Yes. Did and I get the John? And that he's the only one qualified to testify to heavenly things because no other person has ever seen them. No one's no ever other seen them. ever been in heaven. No they, one's ever descended. They, they haven't gone up to see it. They haven't descended except the one. So we got yes. the end of John chapter 3, which John the Baptist saying that, uh, speaking of Jesus, is the one who is from, a, from above. Get that right? Yes, absolutely. They, and then we skip ahead to John chapter 6, where, watch out for the cords, buddy. And then John chapter 6, uh, Jesus speaks of himself as the one who comes from above, as the one who yes, sent. Yes, yes. And then John chapter 8, of course, we have Jesus saying that he, before Abraham was... Yeah. First of all, again repeating, oh, I, am, right. I am from above, you are from below, uh, you are from this world, I am not from this world. And then, before Abraham was, I, I am. am. So if you were, uh, so a fun thought experiment I like to throw out, if you were stuck in a prison, for example, and all you had was the Gospel of John for some reason, and all you read for five years was the Gospel of John, and somebody asked you when you got out, so uh, is Jesus a uniquely pre-existent one, or were we all with the Father from the beginning? Were we all uh, uh, descended from heaven? Have we all seen the Father? Are we all from above? Uh, a reasonable person would say, that's not what the Gospel right. of John exactly. says. Exactly, so. exactly. What's another passage that we heard last night for the pre-existence? Oh, one, uh, and this one's I, think, uh, I think a far better passage, okay. uh, actually, but, uh, um, and, and one that I think is much more common. So uh, we're going back so. now to one that we'll probably more likely hear from our mainstream LDS uh, neighbors. Here at Manti, it's really neat. We get to talk to a mix of people, locals that aren't LDS, LDS people, people who are attending but aren't necessarily believing LDS, and we get to talk to uh, people who are from uh, different polygamous Breakoff groups, and so now this one, this one's gonna, this, this one's, one's gonna heard. be one that's gonna come up, regardless of which of those groups that you're, uh, yeah. that you're dealing with, and that's in Ecclesiastes, chapter twelve, verse seven, which says, uh, "Then will we, uh, then will will we return to the dust." Uh, oh, sorry, then will the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So, the dust returns to the earth, and the spirit returns to God. Now, I, if I'm LDS, I'm thinking, aha, see, the spirit that was given to us is returning back to God. You got it, right there, pre-existence. So, it sounds positive, it sounds... It, hopeful by or? itself it sounds hopeful it sounds like the purpose of life to return to heavenly father and good standing of course and uh you know filling the blank here with lds the, the lds message but uh if we were to just look at the immediate context what sense of this passage do we get let's just go back and we'll read instead of instead of just verse seven let's read six through eight the verse before the verse after okay. that's all we're adding in very narrow context here uh, or ever the silver cord will be loosed, the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and 
the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Why is he so uh, distraught? Why is the why is Solomon pretty upset about this? Because what he's clearly talking about here, everything will eventually break, unravel, decay, and he climaxes with including us. My body. Will, my body will rot back to dust. My breath that God gave me, he will take back from me and I will be dead. This is a biblical euphemism for death, similar to he breathed his last. That the, the word spirit in Hebrew is the same word for breath. Wind or it, breath. Wind, yeah. wind or breath. Uh, and so these, uh, the idea of God will take back the spirit he gave is similar to he'll take back the breath he gave us. So he takes the breath from our body, our body rots, we're dead. So you're saying that this is, refers to an animating life breath yes. that God has given to us and death is the withdrawal, the, with, <laughs> the withdrawal uh, yeah. of, of that breath. Now why, why would you think that, so what other support would we have in the Old Testament for reading it this way? In other words, if I read the rest of the Old Testament, what sort of direction would it be pointed with respect to this idea of wind, well, breath, life? Well, of course, first of all, again, following our rules from earlier, Windy. we want to see what else does Ecclesiastes say about this. Do, does Solomon give us any other evidence of what he means by these words? And in chapter 8, verse oh. 8, he does. No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. You can't keep your spirit in, you can't keep from dying. You can't mm. keep God from taking that breath, that spirit back from you. So you uh, just see what Luke did. I uh, Come in a little bit closer here. I uh, I zoomed out too quickly there and I just was, hey, what about the rest of the Old Testament? Luke basically said, oh, slow down. We want to look at something else in Ecclesiastes that tips us off to the manner in which the, the, uh, Solomon is using this ca word category or phraseology or uh, idiom, uh, this, this yes. way of speaking about the loss of life. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's a very poetic way of describing death, but that still raises the question, where does this way of describing death come from? Where does Solomon get this idea that that's an accurate or a, a, you know effective way to describe the death of a human? And that goes back to, uh, goes back to in Genesis, chapter 2 when man is first created and it says the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life the breath God give, gives us is the life he gave us mm. he breathed life into us and we came to life if God takes that breath back we don't have life anymore and we're dead so God breathed life into us and Solomon says, that breath, that spirit leaves us mm. and we die. Um, Genesis actually uses it that way. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, the flood passage, um, we have, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not remain or abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days will be 120 years. So my spirit's not going to remain in him. What's that mean? What's he going to do? Well, 6, 7, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the Really life. interesting that he talks about the spirit that he has singular yes. that is withdrawn. He's not talking about the spirits out there right. yes. that are going to be brought back. Uh, right, that there's a spirit he breathed into man and we all share in that breath of life that God gave, that borrowed breath from God that gives us life. It's really uh, important as you think about scripture, you have these word categories and it's important not to jam into a word all that a religion or all that a tradition or even all that scripture has to say about a particular word category. Uh, one thing related here is the word study fallacy. We take all the possible meanings yes. of an English word uh, and then you, you, you read that into uh, loosely or entirely or comprehensively read that into a single instance of the word being used without yeah. respect to the context. And or the opposite fallacy where you pick just one definition for that word from a context you're familiar with and you take that one definition and ram it in everywhere you find the word. We have a term for that, it's called eisegesis. Yes, and so you you cannot, um, you know, there's 
uh, my right arm, the right answer, the right thing to do, my right to bear arms. Uh, and it, arm was used two ways, even in those examples. <laughs> <laughs> that you, uh, um, you know, trunk of a car, trunk of a tree, trunk of an elephant. The, the same word in a different context can have a completely different meaning. That's true of spirit yep. as well as anything else. You have to let the context speak for itself. And clearly in the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, there's a way, I'm not saying it's the only mm -hmm. way the word spirit is used, but a way that spirit is used is this breath that God has put in us. God breathed life into man and then said, I'm not going to let my spirit, my breath, remain in him forever. I'm going to blot him out. The uh, issue that came up last night was, uh, made the point that, you know, Solomon probably didn't have, I, I know he didn't have a completely New Testament developed Christian idea of what the spirit or soul or the, the self or the, the anthropology, the, the sense of what humanity is, we have more available to us. This is really interesting here because, you know, Mormons emphasize this idea of progressive revelation, but um, we ought to read scripture with a sense of progressive revelation. We ought not uh, unfairly read back into the Old Testament uh, ideas that get developed later. We be cautious and careful about that very least. So, I, I, you know, Solomon probably didn't have a very developed idea of, uh, as much as we do, the afterlife, the, the sense of the, the self-enduring, uh, the way that happens, the way that works, uh, the, re the resurrection. And he was upset and he said, it wasn't Solomon like the wisest guy that ever lived? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean he had all the knowledge that we right. have. Right, so uh, that, that doesn't bother me. Uh, but I can still say that a person of a previous generation, for example, was wiser than I, and yet I know more than they do about certain things now. Um, anyway, the big, here, the big issue here is that we ought to read things in context. Uh, yes. So yes. There's another passage, uh, am I skipping something? Uh, there, well, just to drive the point home, there are several more examples of spirit breath being for used it. in this way. And I think just to help see that I'm not, I'm not grabbing something out of Genesis and slamming it into Ecclesiastes. Let's see it. To kind of see that this is consistent usage. So in uh, Job 27, uh, two through five, for example, Job says, as God lives, who has taken away my right and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So that Spirit is breath here. That's uh, paralleled there. And I don't think um, LDS people would say that your spirit comes through your nostrils. Right. So, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. um, in the same way that they would use the word today. So, so, yeah. Yeah. so as long as my breath is in me, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips will not speak falsehood, and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right till I die. So all those references to breath and spirit were references to death. As long as it's in me, I'm alive. When it's not, I'm dead. Until I die, I will, I will not put away my integrity. Mm. So Job is clearly using that same language. He does so, he and his friends do so in a number of places. I will give just one more, that in Job 34, 14, and 15, he says, if he should set his heart to it, that he's God in this context, if God should set his heart to it, to gather to himself his spirit and his breath, again, singular, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Mm. If God takes his spirit, his breath back, all the, of us die. The animating life yeah. breath that he loaned you yes. gets taken back. Yes, yes. Psalm 146, three through four. Put no trust in princes or uh, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth on that very day his plans perish. Psalm 104, 27 through 30. These all look to, uh, look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Hmm. Wow. Uh, let's head on to Jeremiah chapter 1. Absolutely. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 1, we get God talking about the prophet in a way that assures him of his calling and of his being loved and sent. Um, and what he says is, oh, I'm going to 
do my, let's see here. What he says in chapter one, verse five is, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. So LDS people, uh, the mainstream LDS people love to use Jeremiah 1, 5 to support the idea that Jeremiah was known by the father before his birth. And the assumption here is that the only reasonable or plausible interpretation of this is that Jeremiah had to have existed before his own birth. Otherwise, he could not have been known. So let me ask you, Luke, how does the Old Testament, how, do, how, how a Hebrew should we understand this term, no? And what other ways is it used? Yeah, so, yeah, no does not necessarily mean I, that you're here, I'm here, and I have a personal relationship with you. Um, I believe you I know had, about you. Right. right, I, right. You, but yeah, I believe you actually had a pretty good passage that we turned to. Amos last night. 3, 2. Yeah. Um, um, God says to Israel, you alone among all the nations have I known. And in Genesis 18, verse 19, I'll pull that one up. Didn't want to embarrass myself about uh, having to find the minor prophet there without having to <laughs> flip, 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 flip. Um, Genesis 18, verse 19, a similar usage. For I have known him, speaking of Abraham. In fact, modern translations even just say chosen. Yes. I have, for I have chosen him. I, for I have known Abraham. For I have known him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So the idea here is that, of course, God knew about other people than Abraham. Right. But for, a for God to have known Abraham means for God to have set his favor, his love, his yes. covenantal, yes. intimate, uh, targeted. Yes, for God to set apart for himself in a special way, to, yeah, to favor, uh, to, pr to prefer. Yes. And absolutely. likewise, God knew about the other nations. So for him to say, Ladies and gentlemen, you, thank you for attending tonight's <laughs> performance of the Mormon Miracle Pageant. Enjoy. Okay. Feel free to talk with the cast as they circulate in the seating area. So when God says in Jeremiah 1 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This isn't just to say, oh yeah, I knew about you. I, I saw you. You know, we talked. It's to say, no, I set my favor on you. I, I loved you. I chose you. And this is where the rest of the passage fits into that quite nicely. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And what we went to after that was Psalm 139, where David is entirely impressed by the knowledge of God, which is too high, too far high for us to attain, that God knows the words that come out of our mouth even before we speak them, and that there's a book written uh, of the days that have been formed for David, and that uh, God knows what the, he, he, he determined, you know, what yes, those days God, will be. That God, to use the words example, God knows my words before my words exist. It's not that my words had a pre-existence somewhere in heaven and then came down and came out of my mouth. God knows my words before they exist, and that's that's stating the greatness of God. And and David's David's like he's not threatened by this. David feels very loved by this. Like, oh, this yes. is the God that hymns me in. This is the God that loves me and is on my side. So we have good reasons to believe that the way that God knew Jeremiah before he was born was through foreknowledge, it was through setting his favor on beforehand, it was through... His, yeah, he, yes, his, he had already, before he created, before he brought Jeremiah into existence, he had already ordained him for this purpose. He had already sanctified the life of Jeremiah for the purpose of being a prophet before he even brought him into existence. Now, I think there was a kind of like incredulousness over this because there's this question of, well, how can God... If you're not born, then what does it even mean for God to love you or choose you or know you? Like, so that I, I would, I would two things. I'd encourage my uh, friends here who are listening to, as you read the Bible, ask yourself the question: 
is the word in the Old Testament know and choose sometimes interchangeable? In other words, does the word know have a sense of choosing in it, uh, of setting favor on? And secondly, do you have a God who has perfect foreknowledge of what has come to, come to pass and uh, the kind of foreknowledge of what's to come, to come such that he could choose um, to set his favor on someone and love them and set them apart and consecrate them that is independent of pre-existence, that does not require pre-existence. So I think one of the questions we asked last night was, is, reading, uh, is a, re- a reasonable reading of this, does that require a pre-existence which we really don't have any good support for elsewhere? Right, and since we do have really strong verses elsewhere, such as what we looked at in John, that clearly indicate that there is no pre-existence, then the reading of this passage that sa- that is God saying, look, this is going, you are going to succeed as a prophet because I ordained it. Mm. And that, that he's giving Jeremiah, who's struggling, who's saying, look, I'm only a child. He's giving him this assurance that, look, I ordained this before you gave him, even came to, to existence. This is your purpose for being. That, that it fits the context mm. completely. It gives glory to God and not, hey, Jeremiah, don't worry, you can do this. You don't re- remember it now, but I knew you and you're awesome. <laughs> Uh, not it's that. not. That's no, not no, no, it. No, no. It's not. It's not. T- t- he's not trying to reassure Jeremiah how great Jeremiah is. Mm. He's trying to reassure Jeremiah that Jeremiah. It's like, look, is I looked at your to... credentials in the preexistence, and we—I I was really impressed. Don't you know? Don't you remember how I chose you to be a prophet because right. you are of such great stature among all the other spirit children? No. no. The, read through the whole chapter. What you see is it keeps coming back to, you will do all of this because I've ordained it and everything I want will be accomplished by it because I will be with you. Mm. It's all to the greatness and glory and foreordained plan of God. Nothing about the nature of Jeremiah and why he is particularly worthy of this calling. To conclude this, I'd like to tell you why I go down this route and why Luke does too. Uh, Paul talks about taking every thought that is against Christ and subordinating those thoughts, putting them under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So we ought to see false religions Uh, not as something that should control the narrative, not as something that uh, really will have any final say. Um, We should see them as opportunities to point people back to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. So when you have a false religion like Mormonism, uh, perhaps in your own uh, religious past, in your own uh, journey, um, you should see that as something, as an opportunity, you should see it as an opportunity uh, to put under the Word of God, to put under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So we want to take any sort of uh, topic like pre-existence, and it's, it's not just about winning an argument, it's not just about uh, besting someone on the street right, or being right. more clever or more aware or more uh, you know, adept at taking the passages. Um, this is about being a responsible interpreter of Scripture because that does bring glory to God and that's, that's, that honors the truth. Uh, but really, we want to use this as an opportunity to show, for example, the unique pre-existent glory of Jesus Christ. Yes. That he yes. is, he's worth our attention. He's compelling. He's, in the Gospel of John, he is unlike the others because he was with God in the beginning. He alone had seen the Father. He was with the Father. He alone had descended. Uh, we haven't. Uh, we're from below. He is from above. So if you really want to worship Jesus Christ as he is, uh, you, you've got to believe that about Jesus Christ because that's what his word says. So, hey, thanks for joining us. If you want to pray for the Christians here at Manti, who are on the streets witnessing, uh, the large majority of it is conversational evangelism done in small groups or one on one. And uh, a lot of love here from young adults and youth and uh, older people that have been coming here for years. And uh, yeah, I, I say, say a prayer for the conversations that happen here. Uh, grace and peace.